In part two, John Waters turns to cultural matters and Sean O'Riada's influence on Irish music. There, there is a kind of neurosis in Irish people, in Irish society, where we are both attached to our culture and, and also, Ooh. in a certain sense, repulsed by it. Ashamed because, of it, perhaps. Yes, because yeah. that's the colonial experience as well. Oh, yes, yeah, it yeah. teaches you to hate your own culture. Yes, yeah, yeah. If you actually look, if you read Douglas Hyde and the way he describes the landscape of Ireland post-famine, you know, he, that the music had actually been wiped out in whole mm. sections mm-hmm. of the, 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 the country. Uh, you know, you can see this in, even in a county like Roscommon, where you kind of go into a strong region, mm. say like Boyle, where there's mm. all these musicians. Then you come up to Castlery, where it's not so strong. Right. Uh, you know, and that's a, t- a pattern right across the country. Mm. And some places it's very intense, like in Clare, in Sligo. You know, others is non-existent. You know, mm. Uh, mm. and and but Arida did try to kind of summon that up and try to tr- to 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 reboot that into a new yes. uh, era. And then you had a tremendous rain, uh, uh, crop of, of, of young musicians coming yes, forward yeah, in the yeah, 70s. Yeah. Uh, Botty Band, yes. Planksy, Christy Moore, of course, and, and, and then subsequently Moving Hearts and Noel Hill and, and, and mm. all these guys, you know. Mm-hmm. And then later, more laterally, of Martin Hayes and people like yes, that. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a tremendous wealth there. And, and, and you know, if you go along to the, to the National Con- Concert Hall now, and listened for two hours to Martin Hayes or something, a figure like that, same Martin yep. Hayes, who was a wonderful, wonderful player. You, you sit there mesmerised mm. and full of pride. Yes. But then you have the, the saddening eruption of, of, of this question, like, wow. You know, would the Ireland of today be capable of generating a music like this? No. But I remember the 80s again. Uh, when there was a huge resurgence. I mean, yeah. you could go anywhere in the country mm. and see a band like Dead Allen, mm-hmm. Frankie Gavin and Alex Fenn and, and those guys, yeah, Jackie yeah, Daly, yeah. Ringo McDonough, mm. places in Athlone or Longford or Belmullet, stuffed to the gills, like mm, mm. hundreds of people, mm. maybe a thousand, absolutely gripped by this music. That's all gone now. If you, like the, the Donnan exists and Frankie Gavin still exists and he has his own band called the Donnan. But there's, they struggle to fill a house in Ireland. Whereas if they go to Italy and I, I, I've been with them in Italy, I've seen them. I've seen mm. them mobbed in mm-hmm. Italy. Mm-hmm. I've seen an entire crowd rush the stage as soon as they start to play. Rush the stage. Mm-hmm. Like this is something again which speaks to our post-colonial condition because we do not appreciate what is in front of our eyes and ears. And that's a function of that inbuilt, uh, conditioned repugnance of who we are, which is a central element of the post-colonial, of the colonial instrumentation of colonisation, of occupation and of uh, enslavement, as Pierre said. And particularly in one essay, The Murder Machine, Mm. speaks about this. But he he speaks about the education of slaves. Mm. And he repeatedly used the word slaves uh, to describe who we are as a people, what we have become as a people. Um, he didn't mean it literally. He meant it as a metaphor, but it is a very strong metaphor in, in, in a collective sense. People, you know, I've heard it disputed, you know, that, that we're entitled to call ourselves slaves because only the, the black, only the Africans are entitled to call themselves slaves. Well, I would dispute that because I think that uh, there are different forms of slavery. And, uh, uh, you know, and Pierce said, you know, that there are worse things than blood, there's worse things than bloodshed and slavery is one of them. And, and in that essay, very deep in, in, the, in the thinking of that essay, you have to meditate to get to it, but it's there, is the same content as The Wretched of the Earth. Mm. It's exactly the same content. 50 years, written 50 years before, in a, in a, in a, a white populated island in the Atlantic a long way from Algeria a long way from Martinique he he Pierce identified the same pathologies mm. that Fanon would see 50 years later and write about in those books and so you see we, we deny this deny it now because we had then when of course what happened well on May the 3rd 1916 
our 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 fate was sealed. Yes. When Patrick Pierce ended up in a pool of blood in yeah. the yard of Kilmainham Jail, there was no coming back from that because he was the one, the sole person, in my opinion, who understood the depth of our situation, the absolute psychic, uh, the profundity mm-hmm. of where we stood. Mm. and what we needed to do to reverse that. And it was a very subtle act. And what happened then was that you got this very crude uh, um, approach in the first instance, which was this de-Anglicisation, the purification of Ireland, you know, in Catholic terms, in cultural terms, in Irish, in language terms, which of course was impossible because we'd already been remade in a certain sense. And a much more kind of subtle, holistic process was necessary, which Pierce, I think, understood. You can read that into what he, what he says. And we didn't have that opportunity. So what we ended up with then was a series of almost ricochets, where reactions, you know, that you have the de-Anglicisation and you have a reaction against that. You have the pushing of Irish and then a reaction against the Irish. You know, and then the resurgence of the Irish and a reaction against that. So we were constantly extolling and rejecting who we are. And that's been the pattern of our life uh, in independence, culturally and economically and politically and otherwise. And it's a great disaster that we didn't actually sit down and reflect on the nature of our situation. And then the other thing is we did we then got the the civil war was disastrous, of course, as well, because it it it's it divided us when we should have been united intellectually and culturally. And it set up these two camps, which mm. still live in a certain yes. sense, yeah. which again was jiving at the crossroads was about that mm. as well. And and uh, so we we we're now in this situation where having failed to deal with this, we don't know who we are. And the way I often uh, describe it is that you see, Fanon when he talks about culture, emphasizes that when a culture is inter- interrupted, it cannot ever be known again. Uh, it has to be imagined. And we never did that act. Joyce tried to do it. That was essentially the point of view, let's say, to create a mythology mm. arising out of, mimic from Greek mythology, mm. Mm. A, a new mythology for a new nation. Um, but it didn't really take culturally. And in a certain sense, you'd have to say that Beckett, Beckett when he came along, almost went the other way. He 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 created a tabula rasa again, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, or a scorched earth maybe, uh, uh, whether consciously or not. And in effect, now we had we have had no Irish literature worth talking mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. for the last eighty ninety years. Uh, we we have essentially a subgroup of English literature, mm-hmm. of British literature. And, and that's another symptom, you see. Uh, and, and, he, and you see, that's part of the colonial condition is that our writers approve of that situation because they want to be approved of in England. Mm. Well, can we, can we perhaps reluctantly um, leave the past and, and look to the future? I don't know if the future, in your view, is any rosier than our survey of the past. But if we are where we are in 2020... Um, and we're talking about the past, the recent past, and how we got to where we are. Can we talk about the future in terms of either opportunities or threats? In other words, wherever trajectory we're on, we're not quite at the end point yet. Can we still change direction? Are we on a slow train, which is inevitably going to reach a certain destination? Or are there other alternatives available to us, which might change the direction we're on and bring us to a new destination? Well, I would say, yes, we're on a train and, and, and we're not going so slow. We're going pretty fast now and we're heading to the wrong, and the wrong direction, mm. um, for sure. Can we stop the train and get off? Can we abandon the train? Can we turn the train around? I don't know. I, I, it's a really good question, but I mean, everything is suggesting I mean, you would have to hope that deep in the genius of the Irish people, there is capacity to fight for their own inheritance and their own uh, country and their own. But, but you know, the, unfortunately, uh, one of the consequences of of this kind of culture, post-colonial culture, is that the 
your leadership cadre, they, they tend to become treacherous. They basically think in their terms of their own uh, longevity as leaders, as politicians, mm. and, and they will use everything that is available to them to sustain themselves at the cost of the country's future and indeed even at the cost of the country's future, present. And that has been happening in Ireland on a, on a grand scale. And we have elected appalling leaders, increasingly appalling leaders. I mean, it's a function, obviously, once you acquire a new dependency, you know, in a, in a colonial in a, in a colonial context, mm. clearly, obviously, the people, the locals who uh, elect to become the representatives of the colonial power in their own country are clearly the dregs of your society. And the same thing happens when you then hand over your the reins of your society to anybody else, as we have in two different directions, metaphorically, in one, in one direction to the EU and the other direction to the transnational sector, who are now engaging in a, form, a new form of governance in Ireland as an, on an experimental basis. We are the petri dish of uh, uh, this experiment, the, 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 the world laboratory of the future of politics. And that experiment is essentially relates to a kind of a public-private partnership in government, using big data as an as an instrument of control, of surveillance and of monitoring, and that they already tried this out in China, and they they haven't tried it in a, a Western society yet. But I believe Ireland is slated to be the first place that they will try it, mm. and they're all here, all these big tech companies, and they have the, the acquiescence of the government in everything they want and everything they demand. We've seen that in the recent past with the referendums, which are clearly inspired by the multinationals, the big tech companies in particular. Um, because, you know, if you were talking about human rights and, and you know, what might come, I, I'm in a particular position to know about this because I, for 20 years in the Irish Times, campaigned on the issue of fathers' rights mm. and I was completely spurned by the political yes, class. Yeah. And then overnight, an issue of gay marriage, which is as far from that as you could possibly imagine as tenuous as you could possibly imagine as a right suddenly it was the most important thing of uh, the century yes and and i'm still scratching my head about that to say the least of it mm. so clearly it wasn't that so they're now in the pocket of the multinational sector and in a certain to another to it's a it's a reciprocal uh, you know symbiosis you know because the other it works the other way as well and the, the tech companies sustain them you know by censoring their enemies by intimidating their in enemies and so on or their critics even so uh, i i think that in answer to your question jim um it's very late in the day. You're pessimistic, it sounds like. I am pessimistic, the yeah. possibility I I of, of changing direction or reversing the train completely. Well, you see, one of the things that's happened that we haven't gone into, and there's so many things, uh, but what happened to the, con to the concept of patriotism between 1966 mm. and 2016, in that 50-year period, patriotism died in Ireland. The meaning of it died. The idea of it died. You know, the commemoration so-called in 2016 were, you know, just an, a controlled explosion mm, mm. of sentimentality. Uh, uh, I, I uh, when I joined the Irish Times in, as a columnist in 1990, and every year around Easter, I would write at least one or maybe two or three articles about 1916 and about sometimes about 2016 and what it would be like, what we would need to think about it. Mm -hmm. I was fixated on this question. Because when you think back to 1966, the intensity of the celebrations of that time, I remember I was a child yes, then. Yeah, I do too, yeah. And, and like it was a very intense and beautiful period. But almost immediately afterwards, because of the, the conflict in the North the eruption erupting in the late, the late 60s mm. and in the IRA and the, the, all of the events, the bombing campaigns and, and so on, the provisionals, that the flag became a, a very dubious emblem and still is. It's extraordinary. I mean, mm. for many years, the only place you could fly a, a, a tricolour yeah. was at a soccer match, mm. it mm. seemed. This idea that World War II, Nazism and all this was something fundamentally to do with the essence of nationalism yeah. is a complete yeah. it's a complete fallacy it's a complete lie and the whole emphasis on the culture of the culture has been to essentially as it were as they would have it 
to make us too small for our jackboots. Mm. But we never wore any jackboots no. in Ireland. No. The jackboots were entirely on our heads, on our faces. Indeed. And, and, and yet we are, our nationalism, our patriotism is smeared with the same brush as German nationalism. And indeed, now you have the extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, paradox where the Germans are demanding of other European countries that we step up and atone for their crimes. And where in fact we are uniquely in Europe, Ireland, were in the situation of the underdog at all times in yeah. history. And, 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 we, and we have no leaders capable of speaking these simple words. Uh, because I don't think there are many Irish people really in their heart of hearts who would not respond to that thought that how unjust, unjust it is that the Irish nation has to basically fold its tent and crawl away because of something that Germany did. I remember actually being at a, a lunch a few years ago in Germany and there were some French people there and uh, some Germans and various other nationalities. But I had made a speech about the EU, which was in the immediate wake of the, the Troika being in Ireland. It was pretty rough stuff now, you know, as you can imagine. Mm. Uh, and and uh, so there was a lot of, you know, noses out of joint at the lunch, you know, and, and not a lot of people talking in my direction, you know, but somebody eventually piped up, you know, that, import, that you know, it needed to be understood by certain people, it was implicit, that the reason that the EU was so important was to uh, ensure that the bloodshed that had occurred in Europe in the past did yes. not recur. Mm. So I stood up and I says, I hear what you're saying, but let me be clear about this. Are you saying that in order for you Germans and you French not to start killing each other mm. again, my daughter needs to go and live in Sydney for the rest of her life? Is that, is that what you're saying? Because that's what's going to happen, mm. arising of what's happened in our country now, as a result of the, of the actions of the European Union, uh, and the IMF and the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is not a good deal that you can't stop from killing each other. But we must pay the price. And not just the economic price, but a cultural, a familial, a, an intimate human price. I said, that's, that's not acceptable. This is, this is the, these are the things our leaders should be saying. You see, this is the extraordinary thing, Jim, that I have found myself. And it seems disproportionate in a way, in a, in a, in a lesser way, you know, the downwards disproportionate rather than upwards disproportionate, that in a certain sense, I mentioned Havel before, I mentioned the whole thing of, of Eastern European and communism and the Soviet thing. You would never have thought growing up in, the, in this country that such concepts might become relevant to, to Ireland. But now they have, in a very particular way, not as grave maybe yet, but they have the potential to become as grave. Because we have, in a certain way, the form of thinking which now in, is now installing itself in order to protect the model that we have chosen is such as to become tyrannical and to seek to colonise history and colonise the future and to discipline anybody who dares to dissent from that arrangement. And we see the signs of this already in Ireland now in the recent past where we have a Minister for Justice musing in public about introducing hate speech laws, which is not just a compromise, mm. the right of people to open their mouths and utter mm. what they feel. Mm. Uh, and and uh, so I think we could be entering into a very dark period in Irish history at our own hands, which is an extraordinary thing. Or uh, ostensibly at our own hands, although, you know, there's no such thing in a way. I mean, the unfortunate thing about these new dependencies, and again, I mentioned the EU and I mentioned the, the, the trans-corporate sector. The unfortunate thing is that it, it creates a form of leadership which is very low grade because essentially the great giants that once you might have expected to enter public life there's nothing to attract them in to become they do, there's nothing attractive in becoming a messenger boy is there you know so they don't want to be Michael Collins would not have wanted to be a messenger boy Polly Pierce would not have wanted oh. to be he would not have been a messenger boy he would not have been mm. he would have said no get out 
you know. So here we are, you see, in this and this. So this is why I'm people, you see, there's a tendency in people now, I find an extraordinary pressure, which is part of the same culture, to demand that you offer what they call optimistic scenarios. Well, have you nothing positive to say about things? Mm. And I always say, no, I don't. I have nothing positive to say. On the face of things, we're in the deepest trouble we've ever been. The thing I've been saying repeatedly over, I found myself saying over, one of the things I've said my, uh, repeatedly over the last few years is that there are no adults left in the room. The adults have all left. Uh, you know, there used to be ways, checks and balances in journalism. I mean, when I went into journalism, you know, when I went to the Irish Times, you know, in 1990, like, I, I, for the first couple of years, I, I wore a shirt and tie, you know, every day, Ooh. even though that was not within my nature, because I thought that was what you had to do. And then yes. I kind of got a bit looser. But nevertheless, whenever I went out to speak as John Waters, whether it was about one of my books or anything, I was always conscious that I was representing the Irish Times. Yes, a great Irish institution. Yes, and yeah, that there was certain yeah. courtesies which yeah, were, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, implicit in that yeah, role. Yeah. You know, that you didn't slag off, you know, people, mm. whether they were you know, influential or not. Yes, yeah. You didn't treat people badly. You didn't insult people. You were respectful to people yes, yeah. and about people. That's gone, yeah. as I discovered in the finish Indeed. up in the Irish yeah, Times yeah. myself, where... You know, I was being attacked from within, mm. stabbed in the back. Yes. But you see, that so that that tells you that you know that tradition whereby you know the grey suits on the second floor who are keeping a watchful eye on things, they've they've stood down. Mm. They've gone home, and now it's being left to the kids. It's like literally the 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 parents have left, gone on holidays, leaving the kids in charge of the of the uh, the house. And the party has started. But the party is the party of destruction, of, mm. of the destruction of everything that is, has been built over thousands of years in here and elsewhere and in the civilization that we have inherited for all the difficulty of that inheritance in lots of ways. But nevertheless, we owe a lot. We owe a lot to, the, to our English uh, conquerors, uh, you know, in various ways. I mean, you know, in, in the sense that we became what we are, Mm. Right, you know, I mean, this is a point that that needed to be made to to, and I think Pierce would have made it. That would have solved or, or dispensed with a lot of the misunderstandings that arose after independence, which is that we were when you are remade, uh, you know, in in a certain way. Like I was conscious of this growing up, you know, that we had a, we were constantly being fed a particular idea of Ireland and Irish history and, and language and music and all that in school, mm. and that that was as it should be. We did have a bit of that at home. But the generality of what we were dealing with at home was English culture. We didn't have a TV, but if we had, it would be English and American. Mm -hmm. We had a ra you know, radio and, and that was English music, mainly in pop stations, Luxembourg and so on. Comics, English comics, war, but the war, Victor Hornet, Hotspur, uh, my sister's Bunty That's Judy, area, yeah. uh, June and school friend, mm. and so on. The books, as children in Blyton, uh, um, Jennings and Derbyshire, yes, uh, uh, Billy Bunter, all of this stuff, right? And then as we grew up, then all the way up to Shakespeare, and yeah. we were taught that yeah. in school as well. Now, it's a strange thing. It was a long time after my, those years when I started to think how separated those two elements were, the Irish and the English, in our minds. There were two different blocks of reality. Mm. And that was because the culture had never got round the idea. How do we deal with the yeah. fact that we are yeah. half English? In I think a certain I, sense? I, if I can interrupt you, John. I think that's that's the difficulty um, because we we have been, I suppose, led to believe that we have, you know, a paradox, a binary choice to make between the old Ireland, which is De Valera, yes. Quaid, all that kind of stuff, forced Irish, yes, or the new Ireland, which is all this other stuff, and we we feel obliged to choose between them instead of saying well well that's a very there, interesting there is a there is an ireland that doesn't require us to choose between these two opposing camps very interesting point uh, and and in fact i remember actually when i was doing a book 20 odd years ago about ireland and you too i interviewed ivor brown the psychiatrist and mm. he said you know that 
the point that that whole, that tendency to think in that way is an Anglo-Saxon way of thinking. Yes, you know that the the Anglo-Saxon is either or, but the Irish mentality is both and. Mm. You kind of. One yeah. and the other, which is a kind of a postmodern way of seeing yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and but unfortunately, the, there's a little bit of that, but not enough of it, or not. It's not uniform in the sense that approach is not. So it's picking mm. mix now, you know. And if if you if your views are, you know, complex and confusing, uh, but mm. they're the right views, then they're okay. But if they're in any way, you know, problematic, then you 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 uh, aren't given any license to be fluid in your. Well, you have to conform things. to a particular branch, and that, those two branches there are only two available, and Irish people are being pummeled into choosing between the two. Hmm. There is no middle ground. There's nothing Irish. Cavanagh picked up those two teams as well later later in in his life, uh, after having tried as he believed unsuccessfully to write an Irish novel. He wrote The Green Fool, which he subsequently re- re- renounced. And then he wrote Harry Flynn, which is a much better book. But I think he kind of renounced that as well. Mm. And he had this thing of, about the Irish thing. He used to, he wrote about this and he talked about it in, in that lecture he did on RTE. It's a famous lecture. Uh, the name escapes me right now. Self-portrait. Uh, and, and he talked about that, that there is no Irishness. Is what he said that you know, he used the example of the 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 winner of the three thirty at Cheltenham. You know, he says that what matters about the horse is not his Irishness; it's his horsiness. And he, that was a big mistake. He thought that you could find and and you know there's something in that. Now it's not the total picture, and I mean it's just something to be contributed to the discussion to to somehow reorient our thinking a little bit, mm. because you know. Somebody else said, and I can't remember who this is, it, it was in relation to France. They were asked to like, define what is, what is French? Mm. He says, uh, I can't remember what it was, but he said, and a really great answer, he says that f- t- f- t- what is French is that you don't have to ask the question. If you don't have to ask the question, mm-hmm. that is, you know what French, being French yes. is. And you see, that's the big problem when your culture is interrupted. You can't stop asking the question, mm. "Who are we?" Mm-hmm. Because we can't find it's like a, a it's like a, a stream that's gone underground, and you know it's yes. down there somewhere, but you can't find it, and you don't know where it's going to come out. You, you hear now a lot from these people calling themselves secular atheists, mm. and the assumption of everything they say, looking out the window, is that everything that is there now can be there anyway. Mm. regardless of what we do. Yes, yeah. We can count on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without any single thought being given to how it got there, mm. what were the conditions that made this possible? What was different about this situation as compared to a village in uh, Zimbabwe that made this particular civilization happen, function, operate and survive? They never think about that. And they remind me, as again, a bit of a cliche, but it's really a good one. The, the guy sitting on the branch, sawing away happily, mm-hmm. oblivious that a couple of more strokes of the saw and he'll be plummeting through space. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where we are. Because the very things that we have come to this point through, Christianity in particular, the essence of our civilization are being jettisoned now in our culture as part of this whole overall package. Yeah. Going back again to 1990 to, to tie ourselves up a little bit. All of that was implicit in what happened in that election. We now realise. Uh, even if you think about the subsequent uh, president, Mary McAleese, who seemed to be the antithesis, has now become in, indistinguishable from Mary Robinson in almost every respect. Yes. So, you see, this is the thing that we are now at the point where we're actually we're breaking up the furniture to keep the fire going. Yes, yeah. And and nobody there are no adults to point this out. I mean, I I I would like to think of myself as an adult, but I I don't any longer have any voice. I don't know if I ever had a voice that was capable of commanding uh, the attention of the space, as it were, because of the uh, degree of vilification that had mm. existed from yeah. the beginning yeah, yeah. in trying to talk about because I started off not talking about uh, gender or, or uh, any of that stuff or 
uh, I was talking in the beginning about issues of patriotism and uh, the the land and and the nature of Ireland, mm -hmm. the real Ireland. What it was Ireland really. I don't agree. I didn't agree with par with Kavanaugh, but I think Kavanaugh didn't agree with himself either. Mm. He was making a point which was worth making mm -hmm. about the, the the paradox of our situation. Mm -hmm. You know, which I will con I I've, I've summed up like this in taking his idea. You know, that the idea of the kitchification of Ireland that has happened. Yes. You know that. Uh, I, I, you know, if you think about what's happened, say, in the novel in the, in the, from, the, from the, 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 the 80s onwards, someone like Roddy Doyle, who has a kind of rejection of that kitchification, mm. sets his uh, books in housing estates and tower blocks. Uh, and that kind of is part of a knee jerk, that part of ricochet thing that I was talking about, you know, that it's the reaction against the reaction against the reaction. And, and you know, that what it's essentially saying is enough of your attached cottages mm, mm. and of course you know we see attached cottage now and we see two different things if we do if we see anything we see a piece of kitsch a symbol of that old gone mm. long gone Ireland we also see a homestead because that's what it is so if an, if an Irish writer was to write about a family that live in a thatched cottage. He cannot avoid seeming to be kitchifying his subject. Mm. And yet he may be treating factually of a real experience of humanity in mm. Ireland right now in 2020. That's the great paradox, you know, exemplified in a very real concrete context that you're constantly either running towards or running away yourself from yourself. Mm. You know, uh, uh, as a person in Ireland, as an Irish person in Ireland, and that's kind of why I think we have such little regard for Ireland to the point where now it seems we are intent upon giving it away, selling it out from under ourselves uh, to all kinds of uh, 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 outsiders, and and I think that uh, you know that we really have uh, uh, to look to ourselves now to see have we any adults left? Mm. Those solid men and women who, when they stood up in a room to speak, mm. brought silence on the room and brought reason to the room. Are there any left? Because they need to step forward real fast. Well, that's it for today. I would like to thank John Waters for sharing his thoughts with us. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please join us for our next podcast, which will be coming up soon. Goodbye.